Hello, I'm Lucas Lynch. Welcome to the 2021 Dairy Strong Conference. As the proud son of dairy farmers, I'm even more proud to serve and work on your behalf in dairy promotion. These last 35 years, you've made a lot of investment, ensuring that dairy farmers have had a voice in the marketplace. And whether it's locally, regionally, domestically, or even globally, it's real, it's relevant, and you're making a difference. Good luck to you in this year ahead. Be dairy strong, but also be dairy proud. America's consumers and the world consumers appreciate what you do each and every day. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Paul Zemniski from Dairy Management Inc. Uh, thank you today for the opportunity to talk about how we partner to drive dairy innovation at Retail and Food Service. I uh, wish I, we were live, uh, would love to meet all the folks individually and, and just uh, again, talk about the great uh, things we're doing in dairy and, and, and how dairy is a powerhouse uh, at the Retail and Food Service channel. So again, I'm just gonna jump right in. Uh, my role at Dairy Management, I'm the uh, EVP of, uh, on the Global Innovation Partnerships team. You know, I'll talk about the purpose of the team. You know, we really formed the partnerships about a decade ago. Um, first, I want to start with uh, dairy management. You just heard uh, from uh, Lucas Lynch talking who we are, but just to reinforce, you know, we're the checkoff working on behalf of farmers, really to build demand and trust in dairy. You know, you may know some of the other entities uh, and some of the activities that we do, whether it's the Dairy Council that's been around for 100 years or use DEC uh, focused on exports of dairy. And, uh, I know um, I've been seeing the logo here for my peer groups, uh, Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, as an example. And, you know, it's a power of an entity, not you know, nationally, locally working together to advocate, to drive sales, drive trust and be a voice for the farmers with and through uh, of the industry, which is more and more important in this day and age. You know, our team specifically, again, uh, when you think about uh, DMI you know, a decade ago, a lot of the effort was on uh, marketing. You've got milk, free a day, uh, things like that. And really what we recognized was we needed to pivot the business model and really start to look at ways to create demand. And, and you know, the first partnerships we formed were in the space of uh, McDonald's and Domino's. And, and again, you think about uh, the, that era where Domino's, uh, you had the food service industry and, and I'll call it the quick serve side of uh, pizza was um, on a downward sales trajectory. You know, they're taking cheese off, you know, really marketing aggressive price promotions at the expense of quality. And I actually, uh, at the time, I was at Kraft Foods on the, helping launch DiGiorno. And, uh, you know, we were benefiting. You know, we, we launched a higher quality product and we were proving that consumers were willing to pay in quality. And so, pan forward to where we are today, uh, D DMI, our partnerships team, really, we, we on the team, we have consultants. Uh, and, and we go into these food service partners and retail partnerships. We have folks who grew up in insights and innovation, whether it's Pepsi, ConAgra, Unilever, you know, marketing brand expertise. We have product scientists. And, and in fact, you know, I'll talk about some of the partnerships. We have product scientists embedded at places like Taco Bell, McDonald's, Pizza Hut, Kroger. You know, and then we also work with these products. We, we want to make sure we advocate the power of dairy and the nutrition. And then more recently, we've really invested in, in these partnerships to make sure that they understand the advancements that uh, the farmers and the industry is making and social responsibility with the net zero initiative. And in making sure that, the, you know, as their, these partnerships understand the power of um, dairy in terms of the ability to export and meet their international growth needs as well. And so we have a full team that really works across players. And I'll talk about how we choose the partners. You know, we wanna make sure we're partnering with large catalytic companies that deliver sustainable incremental dairy growth. And those two words are very important, sustainable and incremental. You know, we will get calls from people that wanna just subsidize a short-term promotion. And re really when we look at those things, we wanna partner with people for long-term that are committed to, you know, five, 10 years of creating category-driven growth on behalf of the farmer versus stealing share from each other. You know, we'll, we'll often get calls from one burger franchise that wanna run a promotion that steals from McDonald's or steals from Wendy's. And then the farmers don't win. Our focus is incremental sustainable sales and trust on behalf of the farmer. So we, we need to make sure these partners are committed to invest in innovation, are convit, committed to invest in marketing and dairy storytelling. And when, what I mean by that is, you know, when we think about June Dairy Month and, and how they talk about where their milk comes from or where their cheese comes from and, and the great uh, backstory behind the products. 
And also they're willing to partner with what we call dairy industry priorities. Again, sustainability is another one, but also just being an advocate uh, for the industry when, when tough times come in terms of media and things that, that happen. So again, we've, we've been partnering with McDonald's 10 years, Domino's 10 years, Taco Bell about five years, and Kroger about uh, five years as well. Just examples of some of the partners we've got. And then we partner in certain areas. You know, five years ago, we started plans to revitalize fluid milk after 40 years of really not putting the consumers first. The farmers chose and said, look, we're going to have to start to revitalize the category um, and, and create um, news in the category. Again, domestic food service, more recently, international food service, working with co-op on the, on the export side to set them up and set the industry up to, to have more of a sustainable supply chain on the global footprint. And we've completed partnerships. You know, one of the more, two most recent ones were Fairlife when, you know, we've helped launch Fairlife in 2015, 2016. You know, they're on their way to becoming a billion dollar brand, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on marketing of fluid milk. And then, you know, an example of Fairlife, why it's so important, things like that. Fairlife's growth through 2019, the first five years, was bigger than all of the plant-based growth combined. So again, we need five fair lives to, to really revitalize fluid milk and, and keep relevance with the consumer. And another one we just sunsetted was Pizza Hut. You know, we started working with Domino's to, to re-establish long-term growth in the quick service pizza arena. Pizza Hut was struggling, so we went in there and helped build their pipeline of innovation to stabilize Pizza Hut. When you pan forward to today, when you look at the, the pizza category, you've got a whole new section of pizza on, underneath the fast casual arena with Mod Pizza, Blaze Pizza, and you'll see them in your local markets. There's all kinds of uh, quick serve pizzas popping up. We've got a healthy category, and why pizza is so important is 25% of the cheese goes out on pizza. So we want to make sure that's a healthy category uh, for the future. So th these are just examples of areas we partner, and I wanted to um, build off of that. So how we partner and what we do often with these partnerships is we invest usually in a lot of the upfront pieces of that. We help identify, test, and validate breakthrough growth territories. When you think about these partners, they all have dairy suppliers, right? And those suppliers are fantastic for quality service, making sure that it's getting in the door. We come in and we're able to look across the industry. We don't have to look at our supplier expertise. And, we, and so we can help them move fast in certain ways and unlock uh, different growth platforms. And we, we step back and we look at where can we create growth platforms. And I'll, I'll give you some snapshots of that, where we've been and also some of the areas where we're looking for the future. But like, uh, We'll do a lot of what we call white space research. We're, we're growth opportunities with a partner. We'll work with the concepts and de developments and, and test those concepts with consumers. As I mentioned earlier, we'll embed product scientists with a partner to, so we can work across suppliers to move and get products out the door. You know, that, that came in handy when you pan back to 2015, 2016, when McDonald's was looking for a ways to create relevancy with their uh, uh, consumer you know, they were considering a lot of ways to do that. You know, they were saying, okay, I need a, I need a cleaner label chicken. You know, I, I need cleaner label blank, blank, and um, blank, on our, whether it's chicken nuggets, chicken sandwich. And we raised our hands with our the, the dairy suppliers as the industry can convert from margarine to butter and we'll sign up for it within six months. Having an on-site scientist that can help lead that type of project is an example of why they chose dairy because we were there and had the presence to do it. And then we also do a lot of pilot market tests. I'll give you an example of that. And then how the dairy industry went is these big partners, then they'll share in the upfront investment, but they'll lead the national launch. They'll put hundreds of millions of dollars in marketing. They'll bring our stories to life through all their social, digital, and marketing assets. And I'll talk about how much money they spend annually on dairy just to support it. So I, I'm going to lead with our food service partnerships and talk about that, and then we can jump in and ask some, ask some questions at the end of that section. I'll talk about retail and our key focus, fluid milk revitalization. So first and foremost, again, McDonald's is one of our key partners. You know, having a seat at the table with the biggest restaurant chain in the world is critically important. So we understand the, the voice of the dairy. We also can understand where they're going for the future. And you know, one of the key examples we've had is. They always had a McCafe. They, they launched the original McCafe in 2008. You know, pan forward to 2015 and McDonald's was starting an, another turnaround. You know, they're focusing on beef, chicken. And we went in with a presentation and said, hey, coffee's coming. There's a huge revolution of coffee. It's going to be cold. It's going to be blended. You know, it's going to have all kinds of different things coming. You, you know, Starbucks, Starbucks is very premium, but that's the tip of the iceberg. But mainstream coffee, you guys have a chance to be a leader in that. 
And so McDonald's looked at us and they said, look, we can't take this work on. We said, we can take the work on and we will, we'll work across the, the, the coffee bean suppliers. We work, we'll work across your equipment suppliers. We'll work within the different um, suppliers and ingredients and dairy and whipped cream, et cetera, milk. And uh, we'll lead the concept development. And so at McDonald's at McCafe, we, we led from and formed the team all the way through the test market. And, and then it was, a, it was a huge success in 2017. And I'll talk more about the results in a second. But that's an example where because they, they were so, McDonald's was, I hate to use the word distracted, but they were focused on their turnaround beef and chicken. And then you guys have seen more recently the beef where they've launched uh, fresh beef. At that same time, we led them in the cafe. And if you pan forward to today, you may not know this, one out of every, more than 50% of the beverages sold in, in the coffee space now is cold coffee. But if you think about McDonald's in 2015, when we started this, they were very focused on hot coffee, just, just basic blends. And so pivoting them to look at the future, now we've got mocha, ice mochas, lattes, macchiatos, ca cappuccinos, and more coming in, in that space. That, I mean, again, that's where we, or trying to say how how what can how can we drive dairy growth platforms and who can follow? Another area of McDonald's, if you pan forward about you know five seven years ago, the only cheese on the menu was American cheese, and there's nothing wrong with American cheese. But you guys know that if you're starting to see an evolution of grocery store at that time, where you saw some different cheeses coming in, whether it's provolone, mozzarella, goudas. And we use, again, we, we bring a lot of trend reports into McDonald's to talk about trends in dairy. And we show them there's a lot of emerging flavors and tastes that they could take advantage of. And so we work with them to launch various cheese platforms. You know, the flavors from abroad where you had Gouda, you know, we've launched white cheddar in there and getting them to really start to appreciate what they can do with cheese and increase the uh, relevance of cheese, both on main dishes and even sides like cheesy bacon fries. And they also had the Parmesan garlic fries. Another area we started looking at and working with McDonald's on is desserts. You know, sometimes people forget it's almost an afterthought. You've got ice cream cones, but you've had, you know, shamrock shakes. And then they had this untapped product, McFlurry. You know, consumers loved it when they tried it, but just McDonald's wasn't really spending any marketing behind it. So we went in and said, let's start testing and, and see if we can get the McFlurry into some of their promotions. And most recently, we worked with McDonald's to activate the Stroop Waffle McFlurry. I always love to tell my uh, Dutch farmer friends that, you know, about the Stroop Waffle and McFlurry, we did that for them. But that was a highly successful last year. This year, they came back with the Chips Ahoy McFlurry and celebrated 25th anniversary of McFlurry um, and uh, promoted it on uh, James Corden. And other things more recently we've done with McDonald's in the dessert space is just taking, even like working with them to take Shamrock Shake nationally. You know, here in the Midwest, we, we see it every spring, but it wasn't a national thing. And they've launched that nationally and then working with them to do Senna Six, which was made with butter as an in and out promotion. And you know, we're trying to work with them more in that breakfast space as they start to add new of these breakfast slides, sides as examples. So shifting to uh, Taco Bell. I wanna, you go back to Taco Bell when we started partnering with them six years ago. They viewed cheese and uh, sour cream as a garnish. Think about it as lettuce or a tomato. And we said, there's so much more you could do to drive your menu increase your sales per unit, et cetera, by focusing on the powerful transformation of cheese and what you can do with it. So in the last five years, we've worked with Taco Bell to transition cheese as an ingredient to what they term internally as cheese's hero. You know, and products including the new cheesy core burrito, the quesalupa, you know, where your cheese was stuffed in the shell, toasted cheddar chalupa, the grilled cheese burrito. An example of the grilled cheese burrito, this was four years in development, trying to get a uh, a, a burrito that can have melted cheese on top that it could be easily consumed by a consumer in the car and then be prepped inside a restaurant in two minutes. So, we, you know, the great thing about us coming from the outside, we, we have the strategic patience that we can work with the partners on and to pick up more longer term projects while their internal development team has to focus on the here and now and drive immediate financial results because they're a public company. Other ways we partner in Taco Bell is we started working, and again, what are untapped spaces when you look at food service for dairy? And for Taco Bell, they had zero dairy beverages. And so we felt like uh, we could develop and really take build off. They have a thing called Breezes and Blast. And we, we said we thought we could add dairy to that and have some fantastic uh, uh, 
you know, products that consumers could, would love. And we, we tested the concepts, the content, you know, some of the t strongest scoring, scoring concepts ever at uh, Taco Bell were, were we called Dairy Whips. And, and, you know, again, talk about another timeline of four years of development to develop a shelf-stable creamer that was, you know, dairy-based. And, and then how we, how we pick projects is we want, we thought this would be a great project where the industry could win. You know, think it could be a whipped project at Taco Bell, but if others follow, you know, imagine a Coke whip with dairy. You know, imagine a blank, blank, and blank where they can take the shelf stable creamer and add it to the project. Project, um, whether it be breakfast beverage, lunch beverage, afternoon snack, etc. So we try to find platforms that that not just benefit one our one partner, but also could benefit the industry. And then uh, again, dairy beverage was a great example of Taco Bell. Another thing, when we sit with our partners, we we say, what are the big three to five things we want to focus on over the you know two to three year contract? In Taco Bell, the third area is breakfast and also new delivery platforms. Even before COVID hit, delivery was a big area. And so we started ideating with them around, you know, how, how can we meet um, more of the group entertaining occasions? You think about a lot of the, the tacos on campuses and things like that. And so we started working with at-home taco bars or cravings packs. And our on-site scientists work with that. And I mean, you think about people ordering 25 tacos that adds up with the dairy purchase and so we've had really strong success at taco bell in those three areas the last couple of years cheese beverage and new platforms Domino's, as i talked at the beginning you know Domino's has been a partner for 10 years is also in the first five years of the partnership was really about investing back into the quality of the pizza more cheese highlighting the quality of the products more more recently it was how do we use their their strong sales momentum and, and 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 their technology strategy to make sure dairy's relevant and winning? And so a lot of the efforts over the last five years is all these new technology formats to order dairy, whether it's your, your watch, your car. Um, further, uh, one of the things we've also learned is uh, is you know they, they were they started out and they they were like ninety plus percent delivery, very little carry out. We've invested a lot to win and help them win in that carryout space because we. One of the things we've learned with our research that without giving too much confidential information out, but when the consumer uh, carries out a pizza, they're usually not stealing share from another pizza. They're usually stealing share from like a chicken occasion, an Asian occasion. So if we can help these guys grow carryout, it's increasing the dairy uh, consumption occasion. And then more, another thing we did about five years ago with, with Domino's was you think about the original Domino stores in the back of a gas station or at the end of a strip mall. We all we work with them to pilot some new ways to bring the, a modernized experience. So you could showcase the product being made proudly. And so you go into a Domino's now and every Domino's in the U.S. has been remade to what they call pizza theater where they proudly show the product. And you have some great cheese experience as an example of that. So these are things we we help test fund and then you know these partners spend whether it's car side delivery 200 million dollars of marketing or pizza theater you know hundreds of millions of dollars refranchising um, uh, formats so when you add the partners up every year um, you know they spend over 1.5 billion dollars of advertising dairy when you think about last year great examples whether it was the relaunch of fresh beef at mcdonald's where it shows two slices of dairy it shows, uh, like I said, the grilled cheese burrito at Taco Bell this year, the, the pineapple whip freeze at Taco Bell this year. So our partners, when you add up their advertising, they're spending well over $1.5 billion of dairy. So huge advocates and huge promotion of dairy from those four big players. And so I thought I would just show you a couple of historical reels, you know, some are older, some are recent, of how our partners have, have celebrated dairy in their advertising.
probably think Domino's Pizza Cheese comes out of a big plastic bag. And it does. But before it goes into that bag, our cheese was crafted to perfection by an award-winning mozzarella maker using milk from family-owned dairy farms. And we got help from a cheese technologist and a National Cheese Institute Laureate Award winner, which is really a thing. So order two medium, two-topping Domino's pizzas for $5.99 each and taste why you can't judge a cheese by its bag. This is what McDonald's breakfast is made of. This is the egg that goes into an Egg McMuffin. That's the egg being freshly cracked. That's the real butter that goes with the freshly cracked egg on your Egg McMuffin. Delicious. Ah, the Netherlands. Home of the Strope Waffle McFlurry from McDonald's. A mix of delicious vanilla soft serve and caramel waffle cookie pieces. Taco Bell's grilled cheese burrito is filled with nacho cheese sauce and a delicious three cheese blend. And even more melty cheese is grilled on top. Get your hands on a grilled cheese burrito. Only at Taco Bell. Only Pizza Hut gives you 16 mozzarella bites on a large pizza. See, kids? Dreams do come true. The ultimate two-for-one. The Mozzarella Poppers Pizza. Hurry and try it before it's gone. No one out pizzas the hut. Perfect. Again, uh, I wish I had time. I, I, I could show you the historical role. It just has some fantastic creative that these uh, partners have done to really celebrate dairy. And again, we need brands to be brands to drive consumer growth, and they're doing great jobs promoting dairy. I'm just going to skip ahead and talk about other, you know, ultimately where the rubber meets the road. You know, we can have these partners, but if they're not moving volume, you know, we, we, we're not doing our jobs. And so every year we sit down and look at, you know, the results of our sales measure that you know since this, these partners combined do roughly 10 billion pounds of milk equivalent products a year you know that's you know since the start individual um, partnerships combined it's over 2.2 billion equivalent pounds of growth you know that's three percent average growth and so you think about the farmers um, you know they've never been inc increasing production over one 1.5 percent a year you know, that's more than double the growth that we're getting on the production side and this is before what we call the catalytic impact of others following these guys' actions. So we wanna make sure we have partners who are driving incremental growth and, that, and you know, really others are following. And so the catalytic effect, and you think about all day breakfast, butter, where people follow the actions. More, more recently, we've been working with Pizza Hut to reestablish stuffed crust. And if you guys are watching the, the wars taking place now with Papa John's and Pizza Hut, highlighting stuffed crust, and it's a lot of cheese moving through uh, those products. In the cafe, as I talked about, I'll show you a slide on the, the catalytic effect back on the cafe and then Taco Bell, we launched queso about you know, three, four years ago. You saw Chipotle follow and, and some of the regional players also, even Wendy's followed with queso. Again, trying to pick platforms that drive um, growth for um, the industry. You know, McCafe, catalytic effect, you know, they launched it, Panera followed, Duncan followed. I and mean, if you haven't been inside a Duncan lately, um, this whole new espresso system they've put in. You know, there's been over 20 new dairy products and then significant ad spending in that space. And even retail, you know, inspired retail. There's a lot of, with the partnership of Coke, you know, with McCafe and Duncan, uh, dairy-based beverages at retail. And again, so if we can create growth and, and stimulate that across the industry, it's going to be a win. And, and, you know, and finally, two other areas I wanted to talk about is trust. You know, working with partners to tell a great story behind where their product comes from. You know, whether it was Jimmy Fallon last year and Pizza Hut talking about, you know, the dairy farmers and the programming to Pizza Hut making a video from where their cheese came from. The Domino's using the boxes to celebrate cheese and tell stories, you know, engaging the consumer with, with um, trust telling stories is an important part of our uh, partner business. And then finally, as we work with these partners, you know, they've got 50,000 restaurants combined domestically and internationally. We want to work with those partners to position dairy for international success. And, uh, you know, three examples I wanted to highlight, you know, just Pizza Hut Asia Pacific, where we talk about the power and the product coming from the cheese in the U.S. In KFC in Latin America, we've actually introduced cheese and chicken. 
which I, 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 t I keep telling my peers in the, in the cheese world, we need to promote more of that in the U.S. When you look at the growth rate of the chicken channel, it's almost 10% a year. 15% of chicken sandwiches have cheese. 85% of burgers have cheese and beef tastes way more than chicken. Sorry for any chicken suppliers out there. But so we need to think about ways to create platforms that we can carry dairy. And, and that's a big area that we've been promoting. And then internationally in Japan and all these areas are, as we have partner agreements, whether it's Domino's Japan, KFC Latin America, in any innovation we come up with, they agree to use U.S. dairy as part of a contract. So um, any questions before I jump into fluid milk? Uh, I, I'll look here in the, uh, the questions. I don't see any. So uh, we can, again, we'll have time at the end to answer some questions as well. So I want to talk about uh, retail innovation. I, and I carved it towards the fluid milk revitalization. I thought I'd get, tell you guys some just interesting facts about fluid milk to set the situation. First, when you think about the beverage landscape, I, I wanted to pan back to the 1970s. You think about what was at the store and how much space was allocated to beverage. You know, you probably had 12 feet of allocated or refrigerated beverages with milk, soft drinks, coffee, juices. And then really a lot of the juices were, you know, um, you know, the little cartons versus fresh juices. 1980s, you started to see the first introduction of bottled water at, at scale. You started to see more of the ready to drink juices and tea come into play. You know, 1990s is where you started to see more innovation in, in, in the beverage space wellness drinks, really sports drinks and Gatorade, you know, started to, to come in. And in 2000s is where you see this massive expansion of the beverage space, really starting to see more functional types of beverages you, you know, and, and also the need state driven beverages like energy drinks, you know, ready to drink coffee was still just starting to be introduced in almond and, and all the fake milks that started to be introduced at that point. Um, and then more, you know, you look today and, and uh, just in the last five years, the average store is carrying about 670 new beverage items. When you, you take 670 beverage items, that's another 12 to 16 feet linear space that they've added. And if you guys haven't been to some of the new Kroger's, they've got an 80 foot single serve beverage run, 80 foot single serve beverages, grab and go with, you know, all those different things. And so we think about where the, the growth has come from over the last 20 years. Majority of that growth is single serve. Now you think about the fluid milk category, we're still majority gallon. So that's what I mean. Just think, think about the, the past, think about the future. We got to be where consumers are going, grab and go. And that was, a, we're seeing tr tr dramatic innovation in that space. And another thing is a lot of people think that the plant-based guys are the cause of our declines and they are not. I mean, I, I give you a great example in, in 2018, Fluid milk declined 120 million gallons at retail, plant-based only grew 12. So you could get rid of the whole plant-based thing, we would still be down 100 million gallons at retail. And, and, and so when you look at the sourcing and the drivers of that decline, we, we follow the consumers in their baskets. It's bottled water, coffee, tea are much bigger impacts to fluid milk's decline. So when I talk about the top two categories there and, and think about the, the innovation that's taken place in those categories the last decade before we talk about what we're going to do to revitalize fluid milk. So when you look at the, those categories, you see technology innovation. You know, look at the difference. You know, you've got these refillable packaging, you know, sustainable packaging. The, the Keurig, the technology, right? Keurig was introduced. K-Cups. Premium, premiumization. We're still, we're, we're selling a gallon of milk for 388 Per gallon, I'm embarrassed. I mean, you look at the price per gallon of this, you're at $40, $50, $60 a gallon for water. And, you know, I, I know it's a scam, but they've invested in packaging and messaging on their patent, you know, to tell the consumers the story, the source. So there's huge opportunities in premiumization. You know, you look at the same thing in coffee, with high brew and just put cool packaging, health focused. You know, you see essential water. You know, and the claims they have, vitamin water, bulletproof coffee, you know, gut health and all this and coffee, flavors and carbonation. And this is where the majority of the sales growth has occurred in water. LaCroix, bubbly, walk the water aisle today. Majority of, the, of water now has some sort of flavor or carbonation to it. You look at the, again, same thing with flavors and coffee. And I'll talk about flavors. important. When you think about milk, it's still 92% white. 
consumers are asking for flavor, I'll show you in a second. We, if we don't meet some changing flavors, you know, they're going to continue to try other beverages. And then food service. I mean, again, dramatic investment in technology and experience. And that's what consumers are today, looking for today. Yet all that in a, um, competitive activity and milk is still a powerhouse. We're in 94% of households. Everybody else in that other slide wishes they could be there. You know, that's 117 million households. We still have 91 volume share of that milk and milk beverages um, category. And we've seen investments in marketing take place, increase, which is important. You know, you need to, for a category to be healthy, you need brands to be brands. I'll keep saying that. You know? And so our fluid milk revitalization strategy was twofold. You know, we wanted to be milk, revitalize and, and stabilize the decline that was taking place because there, there was a lack of innovation. And so, you know, as we look to the milk category, there's health and wellness features, high protein, low sugar, bring attributes that the consumers are looking for from plant or the flavors that they're looking for from oat. You know, again, in decadent and indulgence. When you think about consumer need states, you know, the, you know, I have had a hard day at work, I want to chill with it, you know, and so we've launched some flavored whole milks at Kroger that have done very well. And we also, though, to have milk ready, we've got to play in these growing categories that are on trend for what the consumers are looking for, or energy, like with the coffee and Dunkin' Donuts. Health and wellness and nutrition, you know, and when people forget Ensure and those, a lot of those beverages are formulated with milk and, and they're selling for a ton of gallon. Think about the margin of profits that you can make. And we're letting, you know, um, cold brew coffee, you know, Shamrock's done a nice job of investing in single serve. You got rock and protein, you got rock and protein energy, you know, as an example, trying to blend coffee with milk and taking us to, to compete in another category. So those examples of making sure we're, playing in milk and then also in those competitive spaces. When I, um, so I want to talk to three slides on the consumer. Uh, you know, when you think about the consumer, if you're not putting the consumer first, how are you going to win long term? You know, and so today when you think about what these consumers are demanding, you know, things that enhance their performance, sensorial experiences. If anybody here has kids, you know, watch their experience with food and Instagram and, and, and you've got this global flavor infusion, global media infusion coming in. That's why I said, it's like, we have to think about how do we take advantage of that in the milk space and in responsible consumption. And so in that, that, that consumer, we say that they're looking for this holistic lifestyle, whether it's, it's total mind, body and mind optimization, it's experiences that make me feel good. You know, we, we've done a lot of Gen Z research with kids in high school today. And really one need state directly for them is where white milk Bits and it's called, uh, you know, Kid Strong. You know, they, they want to pound milk to make build their bones and muscles. But all these other occasions, of comfort and de-stressing, that's where flavored milk comes in. Yet when you go to the retailer, you're, you're trying to find a single server, trying to fly flavored milk, it sometimes feels like it's hidden out there. So we got to make it easier for them, those kids to access. And then a good, good for me and good for my planet, there's, it's an opportunity we're going to have to do some things in packaging quickly. And, and so just in summary, giving examples of what um, product territories, what we mean by sensorial, sensorial expense, expense, experiences, flavor, indulgence, customization. I mean, that, that's where Starbucks hits on customization, right, with all these different um, off-the-menu things. You know, peak performance, again, basic nutrition, enhanced nutrition, gut and brain health, energy, sleep, stress. You're going to see tons of products coming that. You're going to hear words like aptogenics. And, and so we, you think about milk 30 years ago, we own nutrition. All these people are adding things to their products. We have to start to think about how do we add these things to milk so they stay in milk versus go try these other products. Um, so we, what we did, there start to revitalization of milk. We, we work with mixologists, you know, food scientists, um, baristas. And a bunch of other folks in the science space to, to come up with a bunch of concepts and went on a road show to, to really show the industry and even retailers. You know, um, you may not know, but 65 percent of milk now sold at retails under the retailer brand. Even work with the retailer to show them the, the opportunity for them that milk's still relevant. There's all kinds of growth space. And we also showed them the facts of milk's still a powerhouse. You know, again, as I said earlier, Fairlife grew more than the whole plant-based things the last five years ago. But also, you may not know, every category in milk over the last five years, flavored, whole fat, 
uh, value added like high protein, low sugar, organics grown. The only thing that's declined on the milk side is low fat milk. So again, a huge opportunity. How do we reposition low fat milk? Is it the flavor? Is it better communication? You know, what is that space? I'll, you know, and then also look at the packaging. We have to celebrate the ingredients of milk. You know, no one's, you know, I would say the majority of the package, especially private labels, not telling me any cool benefits of this uh, around um, flavored milk or white milk, I'm sorry, and low fat milk. So I thought I'd show you some snapshots of products that we went on the road show with and tested with consumers. And some were near in and some were out there, but, you know, examples of antioxidant milk. You know, and this was uh, about a year ago we did these concepts. You know, again, low sugar. So basically, chocolate milk and strawberry with no added sugars hinted so this is one of the areas we looked at how do we revitalize low fat milk is add hints so hints of vanilla vanilla is the top flavor for plant-based yeah try to find hinted vanilla milk or try to find vanilla milk in, in our section let's take some sales from them and also modernizing the kids milk over here enhanced nutrition so rather you know this generation, you you look at the millennials and Gen Z, they're triers. They want to try new things. That's why I said they want to try all these new, different ethnic foods. They want to try new flavors. They want to try oat. So if we don't put oat in milk, and, and I'd rather have it be 100% milk with 2 or 98% milk with 2% oat than have them walk over to the, the fake oat milk section. So we have to think about how do we keep them in our section versus letting them walk and try those things. And then we, we, we push the boundaries. And some of this as a marketer, is you, you also just want to disrupt them. And, and so we tested calm milk, whether it was CBD. If you look online, moon milk's trending because people are struggling sleeping. You know, half of the U.S. tells you they're struggling sleeping. Well, that affects performance. So if we can introduce a moon milk to help people sleep. And then this is the sensorial side, whether it's cake shakes, uh, nitro type of products, and also sustainable production where think about a real milk um, with ugly fruit. You know, and again, flavored milk, um, but, but with the fruits and uglies. And so these are just some of the concepts we went on a road show with, and we took it to some brands. We also looked at dispensing. You know, you look at, again, if you think about the consumer, 90% 90, 90 of kids under the age of 10 would drink more milk if they could access, access it themselves. So we tested these concepts, and, I, and I'm hoping to, in, within the next 12 months that we we're going to have uh, one of these in market that, that we'll be able to make some news around. And so just in summary, within our partners, within five years of starting the fluid milk revitalization, you know, we've got strong performances out there. You've had Fairlife, which I said is on its way to be a billion dollar brand, high protein, low sugar, addressing consumer need. And we're testing the boundaries, you know, Liberal Farms, which is our, through our DFA partnership, Dairy Plus Almond. It's in the milk section. So that milk user comes and sees it there versus going to the plant-based and buying their products over there. But we also don't want to send them, we don't want the shelved in the plant-based and send them over to that section. And, and again, a lot of single serve innovation. As I said, 90% of beverage growth, if you walk the store single serve, but a lot of our assets are still structured in you know, gallons and, and uh, half gallons. And so the consumers are looking for much more port portability. And you know, today, in, in um, this September, we launched uh, SIPs. And it's in test in the Midwest with DFA. One of the things we, we we looked at in Gen Z is ask them what would it get them to drink more milk? And it's accessibility, portability, and it doesn't look like something my my little kid drank or I had to drink when I was in fifth grade or something like that. And so, again, a much more modern experience, aluminum, which they view as sustainable because of recyclability. And again, so just trying to to modernize the category, modernize the experience, and then. Again, similar to what I talked about on food service, we also try to pick areas where we can get catalytic responses. So as we've launched high protein, we've seen a lot of the others in the industry launch high protein, you know, Borden, Horizon, Organic Valley. As we've launched Decadent Whole, you know, Dean's followed. As we've launched some of the ready to drink coffee, we've seen others launch. And then as we launch aluminum, you know, in that space, you've seen slate type of launch. So we're seeing others launch aluminum and milk just to create the experience. And then again, similar, we always want to measure our success. And so, you know, we've seen a lot of innovation and over the last, uh, this is through 2019, but you know, we measure cumulative in incremental milk pounds of growth. And it's over a billion pounds of um, milk growth. The areas that DMI has invested in, whole fat, whole fat has grown 10 points of, of consumer milk consumption. 
chocolate milk is recovery, and that's what's driven a lot of flavor growth and lactose free. Even if you buy, uh, I think it's 2035, more, one out of every two consumers are going to be um, minority. So uh, lactose free is almost going to have to be a cost of entry for the category if you want to be relevant with a lot of the consumers of the future. So, you know, educating brands and how they can get to leverage lactose free in formulations. And then we, again, we, we're just starting to celebrate the investments in infrastructure for the industry. So I'm excited in the next three years, some of the areas we're going to see in product innovation because we'll be able to do more blending, more single serve packaging, some really cool things on, that, we're, that they're doing globally that we'll bring to the U.S. And then again, as part of the innovation and revitalization is a, a rededication of brand marketing by the category that will drive um, more relevance with the consumer today. So I, those are two snapshots of what we do. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to say before wrapping up is our not, we don't just focus on innovation. You know, last year when uh, COVID hit, we also activated plans at retail on fluid milk working with our partners to, to do promotions. And whether we, with Kroger, we did a, a real milk and make it with milk promotion. You know, with DFA, we did things with certain retailers as well. We did a chocolate milk promotion and, and, and then we, you know, so that, that you know, when you look at what the checkoff does, innovation and creating news is one aspect. We also do other things within these partners as I talked about, whether it's just making sure we're front and center in dairy sustainability, or working with them to, to educate and, and bring category management, you know, uh, as an example with Amazon. So just wanted to highlight that, that I, I teased a little piece of what we do, but we do a lot more with them through these partners. I'd love it to open it up to questions. I'm gonna pull a question uh, thing here and see if there's any questions or you guys can start. Uh, okay, uh, I see the questions coming through. I'm gonna read them and Okay, the first one uh, is I want to see whole milk in schools, and you know, so do we. I mean, again, that's part of the, the dietary guidelines. We continue to educate on the dietary guidelines. We've got plans to do it. Again, we have a whole separate group of dairy management that's dedicated to that. You know, keeping dairy relevant, and uh, um, all I can say is that that's a group that's uh, you know significantly dedicated to uh, making milk in schools. But that decision's you know controlled by the government, and we have to continue to reinforce that. Uh, Full fat uh, is is relevant, and that, you know we've done significant, you know, I think 57, 59 studies to show the power of full fat. Um, question number two: uh, milk sensitivity, lactose intolerance, something that we see often. While fluid options such as A2 and lactose free are available, um, is there an opportunity to get these products in restaurants and schools to inc increase liquid consumption? Uh, on the restaurant front, I I'll just say that. Um, you know, we're doing a lot more education, you know, uh, in the space with and through our partners. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example, you know, educating the coffee guys that there's an opportunity with lactose free and protein, et cetera. And the same thing, I think, on the school front with the School Nutrition Association. And, and, and you know, there's a lot in, in our, we just unveiled the DMI's new plan. And one of the key aspects in our plan is winning with the minority consumer. And that involves lactose intolerance is definitely one of the key front and center things that we need to educate again the school industry more retailers more and that is in our plans uh, number three uh, beyond driving sales are the partners helping tell dairy story uh, definitely like I said we put it in our contracts that we, they we expect our partners to help advocate and, and tell the story uh, behind where their products come from and, and so if you go to McDonald's website, you know, there's two of our dairy farmers on their site uh, and where they, where they talk about sensible sourcing and all this stuff. So that's examples where uh, a great, another great example is uh, Pizza Hut, for, you know, we created a video with them that they amplified and, and they've got three different farmer families talking about where their cheese came from. And they, they said that, that uh, when they ran that across Facebook, Instagram, and all their other social aspects, they had 700 million um, use. So, I mean, it's a great way to use partners. And then obviously, Domino's on like the pizza boxes. Last year during June Dairy Month, we used their tracker, you know, so they got 30 million consumers who use their um, Domino's app. You know, they see front and center during the tracker. There's each screen had a uh, dairy story talking about cows, talking about how great the farmers are. So, those are three key things. We, we definitely work with all the partners and 
make, make sure that they're willing to support it. Uh, there's question four was, do you see opportunities to partner with plant-based alternatives? Some brands offer half rural dairy, half plant-based. Is that our opportunity to partner rather than combat? You know, I'll just say, um, you know, just remember milk's a powerhouse. We're in we got 91% of the volume. We've got strong brands and I would, I think we could out market the plant-based guys. And I think there is opportunities to bring the, some of the perceived benefits to plant, but I think it could be, whether it's 50, 50, or like I said, 98% dairy, there, there's, we're going to have to, consumers are looking for new flavors. They're looking for experiences. And, and also, like I said, we're also um, looking for advanced nutrition. And, and so you're, you're going to see things that bring flavor that also bring nutrition. Like if you look at the Bulletproof coffees where it's MCT oil, you, you know, you're going to, I think you're going to see a lot of things pro and prebiotics. And so that's going to involve fibers. That's going to involve, um, you know, you think about oat because people put oat and it's a prebiotic fiber, right? So there's going to be a lot of functional innovation tied to nutrition and health, especially, you know, I didn't even get into the future. Personalized nutrition is coming fast. So, you, you know, you're going to be able to take a blood screen and you're, or screen and they're going to say, blank, 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 here's your optimal uh, menu. And, and that's where we're going to be partnering in that space to show the power of dairy and actually address some of the fake news around lactose intolerance, where a lot of the people think they're lactose intolerant. It's actually some other digestive issues. So we will be leveraging the technology space, too, and partnering in that space in the future uh, to, to, to make sure dairy is relevant. Um, question five, uh, COVID-19 has accelerated e-commerce and how do we position milk and dairy in that space? Great question. You know, uh, from a macro sense, prior to COVID, less than 25% of society had ordered groceries online. Since COVID hit, over 55% of consumers have ordered their groceries online. And then they've surveyed those consumers. A lot of them say they're not, they're not going to go back to, I mean, uh, they still want to maintain and build their baskets online. It's just easier. A lot of them appreciate that whether it's the click and collect where they can pick it up at their local Kroger or whatever their local grocery Albertsons, grocery Walmart, or B, they can appreciate the delivery, you know, around their hectic lifestyle. So, I, so if you, one of the things I, I always tell people, think about the difference between the, the grocery store and e-commerce, e-commerce, you know, fluid milk section has to fit on this and you have to, you have to stand out in this space. Versus we have 91 share of a 20, you know, or a 40 linear foot space. So e-commerce, if we have 50% of society going over there, we need more brands to stand out and battle those competitors who are buying that ad space up. So there's going to have to be an investment in the advertising in that e-commerce space and also education. And the good news is we have, we work very closely with Amazon in, in the e-commerce space as well as Kroger and with our, our partnership to talk about dairy and highlight dairy and how consumers shop the category. And, uh, you know, we're working closely with Amazon, a lot of, a lot of confidential things to, to really drive dairy's relevance. And, and it's a huge opportunity space for us. To, and, the, and the reason it's huge is not only to just to highlight and market your product, but if you dive deep, if, I, if you have an ability, if anybody here has access to Amazon Fresh, you can go super deep in, in the sourcing of the product, the education and the storytelling. And that's where we went. We know once people understand that, you know, the, the dairy farms are owned by, you know, the, it's family farms, it's local, it's their community, they love dairy. But we haven't been telling them that story. I mean, again, like I said, the packaging hasn't been celebrating the packaging as it should. And so there's, there's a huge opportunity in that space that we can take advantage of. Um, the, the next, there's a question here on, uh, let's see. What are the opportunities for grass or pasture-based milk and dairy products? Um, you know, I think you start to get into what, what's the functional benefit to the consumer? Is there a functional benefit to the consumer? I'm a, you know, I, I'm a, you know, I, I'll never forget a Wall Street Journal article where they were talking about the difference between grass-fed beef and grain-fed beef. And, uh, you know, um, I, I just, we don't want to miss market product categories, um, you know, uh, either so i think is there is there a true benefit to the consumer or just is there uh, is it more of a other marketing benefit i i you know so um 
I, you know, again, I, I'm sorry, I wish I could answer that better on a grass based or pasture based, but I think we're, we, we start to fight farmer versus farmer versus how do we grow the category? What, what are other attributes can we add to milk that grows the category versus just trying to non pasture based versus milk pasture based? Are we going to win by going at each other that way? Uh, any other questions that uh, anybody has? I see no other questions. Um, well, I, again, if if I'm willing to, if anybody has questions after the fact or comes to you, feel, you know, feel free to work through. We've got a tremendous farmer relations team here that, uh, or industry relations team here that I, I'm willing to jump on with and answer questions that, that or get the experts. Like there, I know there's dietary guideline questions on whole milk. We have a whole expert team that we can bring them in and uh, work with you guys to answer those questions. Um, Otherwise, again, thank you for the opportunity and uh, hope everybody has a much more successful and uh, opportunistic 2021. Thank you.